reasonable minds can differ. Do you think it matters? I, and I have some, oh, I have some websites for you. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna come up some, I, I have, that's part of the lesson plan. So just to let you know, I have some stuff for you. So do you think, you know, reasonable minds can differ. Do you think that the makeup of the US Supreme Court matters for your cases, right? You think Sotomayor and uh, uh, Gorsuch, you think they agree on everything? No. Anthony Scalia, you think he agrees, right, with everybody? No. You think your local judge agrees with everybody? No. So this is the point, okay? When To be a search and seizure expert, one of the things that you've got to bring to the table is an intuition. Okay, is an intuition. Do you, you know, do you think that based off of, you know, the, the facts of your case and, and do you think you're going to win? And if you don't have that intuition, then you, you got to keep reading case law. And my example here is this. Wayne Lefebvre. Wayne Lefebvre, in my opinion, is the godfather of search and seizure. He is actually the most cited, the most credentialed search and seizure expert on planet Earth. I know you thought it was me, but it's not. And I'm sorry to let you guys down. It's not, okay? So, Wayne Lefebvre, he wrote six books. These six books are volumes, volume one through six. And they're all about the Fourth Amendment. And each book is about 800 to 1,000 pages long, you know, eight point font. You get, this, you get the point, right? And if Wayne Lefebvre was right before you today and you asked him, hey, Wayne, you're the most credentialed person on planet Earth. You have, you have been cited more by the U.S. Supreme Court than any other scholar on the Fourth Amendment. Wayne, do you know everything there is to be about the Fourth Amendment? Can you answer all of my questions with 100% certainty? What is he going to say? That's correct. Nope. He's the patron saint, but he doesn't, he, he will tell you straight up. So therefore I'm going to share with you. If you are talking to somebody who says, I know the answer 100%, they don't leave any room for error. Be cautious. Now I am confident in a lot of things. Okay. Um, a lot of things have been well established, but especially when we're looking at new cases and looking at things that have not been settled, like drones, and you know other technology searches. Just remember that we don't know all the answers yet. So another thing about this is that you know a lot of experts say that it takes up to ten thousand hours of deliberate practice to become an expert at something. Um, that may not be true. I don't know. That that may or may not be true in some things. It depends on what you're talking about. But you know, ten thousand hours is, is many years of practice. And so I hope that for those who love search and seizure as much as me, I, I hope that you continue your practice and you're, you're constantly reading cases. And, you know, for, um, for, you know, for others that are kind of dabbling in it, just remember, I mean, it's, it's constant practice. All right. So a to me, a search and seizure expert has three characteristics. Number one is they're constantly reading case law. And I'm gonna show you how to read case law in the way I do it, okay? Because the good news is, is that you do not have to read every single word in a, in a case to understand, you, and you shouldn't, by the way. You should, if you're reading cases from top to bottom, um, you're wasting a lot of time if, if all you're after is the search and seizure nuggets. Now, if you are an attorney, that's different. You're looking for different things. But if you are a cop or you're a trainer, and if you're reading the whole entire case, you should be skimming some of it. And we'll talk about that. The second thing a search and seizure expert knows is that facts matter, right? Facts matter. There's a saying out there, bad facts make bad law. Bad facts make bad law. The opposite is true. Good facts make good law. 
Facts matter. You know, you take this case called Rodriguez. I've talked about it many times in my training. It's the case out of the U.S. Supreme Court. An officer in Nebraska, you know, detains this guy named Denny's Rodriguez for seven minutes to do a, um, a suspicionless cert or sniff on his car with his canine. That's bad facts, right? That's shitty facts. Why is a cop detaining somebody for no reason, right? And saying that, well, it's minimal time and, and so forth. And there's some other reasons. It's minimal time. It's not that big of a deal, right? And first of all, it's not the cops saying that. It's the lawyers. So I don't blame the cop. I blame the lawyers. Why is the prosecutor even arguing? Why isn't the prosecutor dismissing those, that evidence? I don't care what it is. I'm sorry. Look, that's a bad search, guy. Don't, you, know, you can't do that. You can't be holding people up for seven minutes for no reason so you can run a dog. That's a bad facts case. And the, the problem with is bad facts also make bad law. That case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, and now we have a crappy case that further restricts us from doing our job and, you know, and so forth. Finally, you should uh, search and seizure ex experts develop an intuition for of reasonableness, okay? Some things should not smell right to you. Some things be like, wait a minute, what do you want to do? Uh, I, don't, I don't know, man. That, that, something don't seem right on that. Um, actually, a lot of you guys do have that intuition. You know, in my years of, of training these classes, I'll ask officers questions, which can be a little complicated. But a lot of officers get the right answer because they have an intuition that, you know what, I wouldn't do it. They may, the, the cop may not know why, but I'd rather you have the intuition and come up with the why later. If, if that makes sense. Same with good facts, make good law. So a lot of officers say, man, that sounds reasonable to me. That sounds reasonable to me. And I'll, and I'll say, and, I'll, and I agree with them. I say, well, why do you think so? I, I don't know. I mean, it just seems like it's reasonable. And that's, that's good. That's where you want to be first. And then the next step is to be more in my position, which is be able to articulate why the courts are going to uphold or not uphold what you're doing. All right. Let's talk about finding case law, which somebody already brought up, which is a great question, okay? First of all, Google Scholar does have a, a search engine just for case law, and it helps. It's good. I mean, it's, the price is right. It's free. Um, it's not the best. It's not the best. I'll tell you what the best is in a second, but it's going to cost money. Actually, you can get access for free if you, know, if you have the resources, and, to, and I'll tell you where to look, but... So Google Scholar, so when you go to uh, scholar.google.com, you can choose case law, right? And also you wanna select your courts. So, right? So if you're looking for a case out of your circuit and out of your state, then select those two things. And I do, you know, you, depending on what you're searching for, you may wanna search for both at the same time. So, you know, if you're in the first circuit, you know, you, you hit First Circuit plus Massachusetts or something like that, that's going to help you. Or if you just want state cases, that's great too. So there's that. Um, you'll also notice that not all states, you know, have your district court cases um, for the state, right? So like Nevada, for example, only has Nevada Supreme Court. That is, that is the problem with Google. They're not, they're not um, um, saving and having access to every single district court case at the state level in in Nevada and that's a problem because a lot of your a lot of your answers do come from those lower case lower court decisions but the price is right so let's say that we you know you put in Fernandez versus California right that, I'm gonna give you as an example so if you put in there there are your 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 cases right it, they're all the same case just different citation I mean different uh, locations and so forth but that's great. Now you can actually read the case and it'll bring it to other resources and so forth. So that's good. That's great. Now, here's one thing about Google though. I mean, you, if you put a specific case name and that case name is a, is a US Supreme Court case, no problem, it'll, it'll bring it up. But if you are looking for a state case and there's a joke in New Jersey, right? If you wanna just, if you are a lawyer in New Jersey and you have, you don't, the judge asks you, uh, counselor, what, what case are you basing your argument off? Just say state versus Johnson and you're gonna get it because <laughs> that is the most popular case name in New Jersey and it's funny, but true. So if you're looking for a case 
that has a generic name like, like Johnson and so forth, how are you gonna find that case? You need what's called Boolean logic, okay? The ends, the ors, and the, and the quotation marks. These are gonna be your best friends. If you are looking for a case involving a search incident to arrest, do not put search incident to arrest. Put quotation search incident to arrest end quotation. Otherwise, you are gonna get a ton of crap in your, in your filter. If you are looking for search incident to arrest, but you do not want it to involve an automobile, use minus sign automobile. If you want to include, if the court doesn't call it an automobile, they call it a vehicle, but you don't want those cases, put minus sign automobile or vehicle, right? That way you get search incident to arrest of the cases that involve homes on the street, in the business, et cetera, but there is not gonna be any mention of vehicle or automobile in that case. So Boolean logic, what I would do is, is you can actually get, um, this is just a start of it. I have a list, well, and, this, and I use them, I list for a different search engine, but I have a list of Boolean logic connectors and it's like a whole page long. I mean, it's, it can be very, you know, very complicated, but in order to really um, find case law, you have to use Boolean logic. Otherwise, you will get um, a, a results that have 800 cases. There's no way you can do that. And, and lawyers will tell you, when lawyers research cases, they should. I mean, they're going to use this type of logic and plus more to, because they just don't have time to sift through even a hundred cases, you have to get to the point. So that's key. And, and actually use this in other, this, these um, uh, connectors often work in other search engines. Okay, Westlaw. Westlaw is the gold standard in my view. LexisNexis is also okay, but, here, but it's the gold standard for, for research, okay? Um, but it's not free. Hold on to me. Right. It's not free. So I, I, I love it. I love Westlaw. Okay. And one of the reasons I like it is if you, if you go to, you know, let's say we're going to this case, you know, it tells you it has what's called head notes. Okay. Now, so before you guys are just kind of like saying, well, Anthony, if, if it costs money, I'm not going to use it. I understand it. My, my plan is, is worth about $700 per month. That's, that, that's kind of access that I have. I have access to every single court case and I also have access to all the, the, you know, the treatises, the, the, all the secondary, the treatises like um, is, a, is, a, is, is basically a book about certain subjects, right? So I have all the search and seizure manuals for every state. So when I go to Pennsylvania, I don't just, uh, you know, use the laws from Texas. I have to, I have to look at what Pennsylvania does and what they do differently. And so that's what I do. I look at those, those treatises, but I have access to those and they're, they're worth a lot of money. For example, Wayne LaFave's book, which I have through Westlaw, that's $1,500 if you were to buy it just to, just to own it. Right? So, but when you look at Westlaw, it breaks everything down for you and you can get access through legal libraries. So, the main place for free Westlaw access is at the courthouse, okay? If you have a big enough courthouse that has a legal library, oftentimes their computers have access to Westlaw. And that's a great resource. I know it may be a, um, a pain, but if you're already there anyway and you're looking to research some cases, hell, pop into the library. But if, you're li if, you're, if you don't have access, right, because you don't have, your, your courthouse does not have any computers there for Westlaw, then you may not have any access to Westlaw, but I'm just throwing it out there. A lot of courthouses do have access because they kind of have an obligation to help indigent, indigent um, uh, defendants who do not have lawyers appointed to them because their cases are not, um, they don't get a lawyer or they're, they're, they're defending themselves. So that's where the Westlaw comes in. But you can see that the, the principles here are broken down in, in bite-sized chunks, right? 
And this is just great because you go through it and you just, you go through the head notes and you're looking for information that's, that's part of your research and you can skip over the other stuff, right? Also, you're like, hey, you know what? There's a US Supreme Court case on this. Now, Fernand, uh, California, or Fernandez versus California is all about that case involving the non-consenting spouse who left, he actually was arrested, but who was who exit you know who left the home for a lawful reason either a he left on his own or b he got arrested for a lawful reason, not just to get him out of the house. So a lot of a lot of cops are interested in them like okay well do we have any cases in New Mexico about that issue? Well you can go through to citing references in every single court case that has cited Fernandez versus California in their court case is here. So then you can actually, let me see if I have it, then you can actually break it down by states or circuit court. It's pretty, it's pretty powerful. Um, I thought I had uh, Justy up here, and I guess I didn't, but it was part of my prep, so I, I apologize. But um, Justia is J-U-S-T-I-A dot com. It might be, it's dot com, I think. That is also another great website for researching cases. Now, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna also share with you that I've done a pretty good job too of, of putting cases, like giving you references for cases that will work, right? So in the Search and Seizure Survival Guide, it's each topic is one page, right? It's one page and it gives you, well, maybe two pages also with case examples and it tells you what I think the law is. More importantly, I think it's, it's telling you what I think the law is looking for. I could have went through it and said, hey, hot pursuit, legal standard, be reasonable. Um, Emmett destruction of evidence, legal standard, be reasonable. I could have done that, but I didn't because it's useless. And instead, I, I said, I gave you kind of like the, the phrases and the topics that the courts are looking for. So consider getting the book also to help your education. I think it moves the ball forward but there are plenty of other resources out there as well. And I recommend grabbing all of them. You know, I, I have no problem with people trying to contribute knowledge, right? I think it's great. I think more is better, not less. Also, don't forget that it may be worth it. If you are going to be a trainer for your agency, it may be worth digging in your own pocket and buying a state specific resource. Now, the resources that are sold to directly to lawyers from Westlaw and Lexis are a complete ripoff. All Westlaw needs is, a, is, a, is a, a mask and a gun and they'll be hit up for armed robbery, okay? So, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> uh, all right, so somebody sent me something. It didn't go to everybody, but it was damn funny. All right, so, one good thing out there, though, is, is uh, you know, Westlaw has a lot of resources and they're great, but they are like hundreds and hundreds of dollars just for a book. But a lot of states, and here's an example from Texas, a lot of states make their own search and seizure manual. Now, it may be by the AG's office, Oregon. Oregon has a, a search and seizure manual that the, that the state AG sells. It's like 80 bucks. Completely worth it. Um, Texas. The, the Texas District and County Attorneys Association make, uh, have a book about search and seizure, and it's dedicated to Texas case law. It's 40 bucks, completely worth it. New Jersey has a book out of a guy named um, Larry Holtz that's sold by Blue 360 Media, also one of the publishers of one of my books. It's like 150 bucks, completely worth it. So don't forget about those resources. Also, there's a lot of resources in California. So um, honestly, if, if, if you are serious about this and you really want to be an expert, get these books, get those books as well. The ones that are state specific by your district attorneys association and so forth, they're money. They are really, really spot on. Now let's talk about reading case law. That's correct. Yep, Larry Holt is New Jersey's godfather of search and seizure. The guy is brilliant. And he's in Florida somewhere uh, tanning it up because he, uh, he got out of the cold. But um, he, I think he teaches a little bit here and there. But 
uh, there's a lot of states have these like these godfathers. Illinois was is Dale Anderson, right? Um, but you know, so forth. Don't forget about me, guys. <laughs> All right. The goal is to understand the facts and the reason why um, the court made its decision. Don't get stuck in the weeds. Right. Don't get stuck in the weeds. Just what you're trying to do is, you know, you don't have to understand all the nuts and bolts of a case to understand what's, what you're looking for. To, you know, there, I can't give you an example here, right? Oh, that's where I use Justy. I use it for the actual case reading because they don't, um, they don't break it down for you. They actually just tell you what it is. So, for example, if you go to Fernandez versus California, right? So here is an example of a, of a Supreme Court case. Supreme Court cases are great in the sense that they have, um, they have a, um, a basically a syllabus or a summary of that case. Most of them do. That's fantastic, right? And so that's what it is right there. That, that is the summary for the case. Now, most cases do not have summaries. You actually just have to start reading the case to find out what's going on. So if there's a summary, start there. Now, the, the, the next place you want to go to is the facts, okay? Facts matter. Facts really, really matter. And some, some people, right, they will read a case and they'll say that this search and seizure was upheld because, you know, uh, you know whatever. And they'll just take that little blurb and they'll say, that's the rule. It's, it's, it's hard and fast. It's bright line. No. Not necessarily. Facts matter. Okay, so you can have you can have a different case with different facts, and they'll just it's just going to come out different, even though you thought it would. So read the facts. In fact, in fact, I like the facts the most because these are like they're cop stories, right? What did the cop do? What did he didn't do? And so forth. These are like little novels about they're like little crime novels. So then you read the facts. Then you want to start skipping over BS. Okay, start skipping over BS. You do not care about the procedural history. You don't necessarily care about what the elements of a certain crime was, not for search and seizure. Okay, search and seizure does not care about um, state laws and so forth. Fletzy, by the way, is a, yeah, actually, Lou, can you resend that, or Leo, I mean, Leo, can you resend that to everybody? Um, that's great. So, Fletzy, and I have these books, by the way. Fletzy actually has two books. There we go. One is the is a, a Fourth Amendment guide, and one is a, 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 a resource. They're, they're kind of similar, but they are excellent resources for law enforcement. Excellent resources for law enforcement. Okay. So don't get stuck in the weeds for all this procedural history and, and so forth. What you're looking to get down to business is reading the facts and then reading the part that analyzes what happened in your case, in this case, okay? Yeah, they're excellent. So, so what we're looking for in, for us, the, the main argument in Fernandez was how can we get consent from somebody after the non-consenting person has left? And you can see that the court is talking about this brings us to the second argument that his objection made at the threshold of premises that police wanted to search remained effective until he changed his mind and withdrew his objection. You know, now we're going to talk, the court's going to talk about, well, that's not reasonable. You are disempowering the person who remains on the premises. You're taking a risk that the person that, that's left behind will betray your trust, blah, blah, blah. That is the search and seizure principle. This is a way to just read cases and not get stuck in the minutia that lawyers love. You don't care about that. You care about the search and seizure principle, right? And finally, finally, make sure this is actually <laughs> kind of like a, um, a, a, a golden rule kind of. Make sure you read the last part of the case and make sure that it's coming out the way you think it came out. Um, what I mean by this is sometimes you will read that analyst, right? And it'd be like, oh man, okay, I see. And then you'll kind of get lost a little bit or, or 
the courts will talk about something else and then they'll come back to it and say, well, but in this case, it was not upheld. And if you want to know that, you don't want to be thrown around a case that you're saying is, you know, that they decided in your, you know, that supports your position, but actually in the end, they say no because of some other rule that you didn't really recognize. So make sure the case is in your favor. And so here, you know, it tells you that, that uh, Fernandez's consent was valid and, and so forth. And that, that supports our position that if the person left, you can go back to the wife, girlfriend, whatever, and get consent from her on other, other stuff that she has common authority over. Okay, oh yay. Oh yay, oh yay, oh yay. That's a, a phrase uh, that, they, that they use in open, when, they, when they start an open court session at the US Supreme Court. So OEA.org is a great place for, um, um, for getting, you know, getting access to the, to the cases, but also OEA has links to the, to the oral arguments of a case. Now, I'm going to throw this out here. Guys, 80% of you are not going to probably go to OEA. I don't know. Right, I'm guessing here, maybe more because you guys are on this webinar and you're interested in teaching search and seizure. But this is for the for the, the geeks in the house, people like me. If you want to understand really what went on behind the scenes of a case, this is a great way to do it. This is a great way to do it because you'll end up hearing the oral arguments and OEA will actually show you the words, they'll highlight it, and they'll play you um, They'll, they'll play, you actually hear the, uh, the audio. Hold on a second. But when somebody is present and tells the police officer that he refuses consent, that presumption is reversed. Then when the police full well know that one person doesn't have the delegated authority to speak for the others, they must respect the objection, and a failure to do so violates the Fourth Amendment. In other words, Matlock already gives the police all of the benefit of the doubt. Look, maybe you're into it, maybe you're not, right? Um, I think it's cool as shit to hear oral arguments. But when somebody is present and... I think it's cool as shit to hear those things. Um, that's something that I just, I enjoy. In fact, when I'm on, when I used to travel every week, I would play a bunch of these, um, and they have an app. The app is really crappy, <laughs> but, um, it's not the best. It's kind of hard to, it's, it, it needs updated, but they allow you the, the app, it's, you know, look on app store for OEA and it'll allow you to download the uh, audio offline and you can listen to it as a, almost like a podcast. And they're only, only, they're an hour long. So each oral argument is an hour long. So the one person goes first, he or she has a half an hour, and then their, you know, their count, their, 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 the, the other council has an, a half an hour, and then boom. It's just, it's great. And, and somebody already wrote me that they thought it was pretty cool. I hope you guys enjoy it. The other thing that OEA does, okay, is they break down the case for you in a bite-sized chunk, which is always nice. So here, remember, right, you saw in the real Supreme Court case, they have the facts, but they will edit it down so that it's just a bite-sized chunk. So you read the facts and then you read the question, right? What, why is this case so important? So does the Fourth Amendment prohibit warrantless searches when the defendant has previously objected but is no longer present in the co-tenant's consents? Bam! That is what we're after. That is what we're after. And then Oye will tell you what the conclusion is. No, right? The person, it's not reasonable to up, that they can't they can see consent. And they'll tell you why. And they'll even tell you what justice is, um, what, what justice is, right? Agreed with that decision and, 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 and disagreed. Now, you can see that Ginsburg is on there and she's kind of faded out. Um, that's actually, a, she, she voted for it. That's her ghost. Because <laughs> nobody's seen her in two years. That's why I say that. Where is she? I want to see pictures. 
All right. So <laughs> now we're going to talk about the three golden rules of search and seizure. Okay. So now <laughs> these golden rules <laughs> are intended to help cops stay out of trouble and make good case law. Look, do you want my recommendation? I think you should teach these every single time. If you are teaching a class on search and seizure, I would share these golden rules every single time. If you have, if you think, ah, eh, maybe this one is not as, then do it, you know, change them if you want. But this is what I recommend that you, that you take from this class and then teach them. Number one, now this one, I don't think you could ever find a golden rule more important than this one. I don't, I absolutely don't. You can't beat me on this one. This one we, we all agree on. The more you articulate why you did something, the more likely it will be upheld in court. Do I get an amen, yes or no? <laughs> yep. <laughs> amen, brother. Absolutely. I get an amen. It is so important. This is why I wrote this book, because time after time, I'm seeing officers that have good cases. They did the right thing. But when they went to write the report, or look, or they have a chance to explain it in court. It's not in the report, which it should be, but okay, we have a, maybe we can try to fix this in court. They're on the stand and they're like, um, uh, you know, and even the prosecutor is not quite sure what the logic is. No, no, no. We need officers to articulate. And here's another thing. When I talk to officers about cases that they have lost or lawsuits that they have gotten sued over and they've, and they've lost and their department paid money. And I say, hey, what really went on out there? Tell me what happened. And they'll tell me, okay, their narrative. And they'll tell me what happened. And they'll, they'll tell me as a cop would tell me, right? They don't hold anything back. They're not trying to be prim and proper for the court. They're just telling me what happened. And I'm like, I'm like, did you tell the court about that issue right there? And they're like, what issue? This one, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, no. I said, that's why you lost. That's why you lost. Because you had it. You didn't realize that you had it, but you had it. They, that needed articulated. Now, so that is also why I wrote this book, right? is to tell the, is to show the cops what needs articulated. Let me give you a perfect example of this, okay? You do a pat down on somebody and you feel something in their pocket that let's say it's a meth pipe. And you say, this is a true story. A, a, a cop said, I, I felt it. I felt a hard and inflexible object. I then retrieved it and confirmed it was a meth pipe. I ain't gonna win it. No, that hard and inflexible uh, object could be a cigarette lighter, right? It could be, you know, it could be a, 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 a it could be um, a, a pack of, um, of Tic Tacs, right? So the officer missed a key phrase, which is it was immediately apparent as contraband. And then you have to explain why. So my point is articulation is king, right? I also feel the opposite is true as well. Bad or no articulation leads to bad case law. Uh, not what the officers did or didn't do. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. In fact, maybe even uh, Rodriguez is a good example of that. There's actually a chance that that officer in Rodriguez, right? Remember the, the dog case with the seven minutes? That he actually had reasonable suspicion, but he didn't articulate it. Why? Because he didn't think he needed it. Um, so that's a lack of articulation example. Yeah, so what I'm trying to say is under right... So just make sure we're, if you're patting down a person for weapons, you're not patting down for drugs, correct. But during the pat down, you feel an object, which is quote, immediately apparent as contraband, evidence and so forth is plain field, right? That's plain field. Then you can go in there and grab it. Number two, okay, number two, the more serious the crime, the more reasonable your actions are likely to be viewed as reasonable, right? Serious crimes get more leeway, okay? So my analogy is this, the Fourth Amendment is a rubber band, 
okay? The Fourth Amendment is a rubber band. In other words, it restricts you. It's designed to restrict you, not a citizen, you. And so when you are dealing with, when you're dealing with minor crimes, candy bar thefts, jaywalking, right? You don't get to pat people down over that. You got to have something else, right? Um, you don't get to, you know, take a long time for detentions. You know, time is ticking. You got to get down to business. Are you going to write them a ticket or not? I'm not saying you can't, you know, investigate, but I'm just telling you, it's, you know, you don't get to use force. You don't get to point a gun at a candy bar thief. But when you are dealing with a sexual assault suspect, a gang member, a drive-by shooting, armed robbery, strong arm robbery, et cetera, the rubber band loosens up. The, fourth, the, the rubber band is the Fourth Amendment. And what the Fourth Amendment is going to allow you to do is now your arms are not tight to the side. You can actually reach for your gun, get on the ground, handcuffs, take a long time to detain, and so forth. So it's just a guiding principle. And, and what I like about this is that, again, a lot of you said bad facts make bad law. When you are being heavy handed on a, a bullshit case and you're being heavy handed and you know, the court may not give you a lot of room. They may restrict you and just exclude the evidence. But when you're dealing with a serious crime, then they're gonna bend over backwards, typically to uphold what you're doing. So how do you feel about the term experience and training as justification for knowing and recognizing what it is? I absolutely think it's, it's, it's vital, but we do wanna know what that training experience, right? That T&E has actually taught you. And one of the things about playing field, and this might sound weird, <laughs> um, but I talk about it um, in one of my classes is practicing, playing, pat, practicing pat downs. I know you've done, pra you practice pat downs in the academy, but when you practice those pat downs, I'm pretty sure it was only for weapons. The blue gun was in, you know, an armpit area, the waistband. But have you ever practiced patting people, fellow officers down with drugs or pipes in their pocket, in their, in their shoe and so forth, right? You, yeah, I, I hope so, right? Exactly. You, because if you haven't, when you go to court and, and, and you're saying, my training experience that this, I knew this was a meth pipe. Well, what is your training experience? I mean, you, you have something, but if you can say, your honor, my training experience includes practicing these pat downs, right? In a controlled environment. And we had, we put, you know, meth pipes that were, you know, probably not used, right? They probably should be brand new if you get some brand new. And we practice patting these downs and your honor, I know what these, what contraband feels like and so forth. Finally, rule number three is just make sure the officers know that whatever, whenever they do a warrantless search or seizure, that they have to conduct that search or seizure in the same manner as if a judge would have given the warrant. In other words, what I'm trying to say here is that cops don't get any extra powers that they wouldn't have had already when they do a warrantless search. In fact, they get less because all warrantless searches or seizures are presumed unlawful. Don't take it personal, it's just business. But the US Supreme Court has made this clear. They said, essentially, when an officer walks into court and they conducted something without a warrant and it required a warrant, presume it's unreasonable. Let him or her justify why they did it, which brings us back to rule number one, articulation. So my example here is, you know, if you're looking for a stolen MacBook Pro, and you're searching in a car under the automobile exception, so far so good, can you look in the eyeglass case? And the answer is no. Can you look in the engine compartment? And the answer is probably no. I, I, but Anthony it could fit there. That's not, do you think a judge would allow you to look in the engine compartment for a, a computer? Probably not. Unless you can give him or her some facts or circumstances what, to believe that it, it might be there. It's what is reasonable exactly. At the end of the day, is it reasonable? Now, additional resources. Look, I have a class starting tomorrow, the advanced search and seizure class. I start at 9 a.m. Central Time. 9 a.m. Central Time, right? So this is a chance to really get, if you want to become an, a search and seizure expert and you want to be the go-to person or you want to make good case law, then take one of my classes, the all-day classes. These webinars are great for filling in some holes here and there, 
But if you really want to fix the whole boat <laughs> so it has no more leaks, you've got to really take a full in-depth class where we can dive in deep on a lot of subjects. And it's half price. It's like 75 bucks for tomorrow. And then, and then on Tuesday, I'm sorry, on Wednesday, I do traffic stops, advanced traffic stops. And on Thursday, I do advanced criminal investigations. Each day is like 75 bucks or something like that. So this is the last day, the last week you can get the discounts. Once we go back to May, we're back to um, regular prices. And Demetrius, I appreciate that, man. So, so, okay, Bill actually has a good question. I'm doing Central Time and Kelleher is doing um, East Coast Time. So we have two instructors both going on at the same time. <laughs> I, I have to get up early. I have to get up early. So, so Bill, both. But um, I just want to let you know, I was teaching, I'm teaching essential time and Ann, a, a phenomenal instructor is teaching East Coast time. All right, so now we're going to how I train search and seizure, okay? This is unique to me, okay? This is, I, I don't, you know, but somebody, if somebody is doing it, they probably got it for me. This is how I teach search and seizure. So I go through four questions, okay? And this is, this, this is true whether I'm teaching veteran officers who have 20 years on the job or I'm teaching cadets. I want them to know the answers to four questions because if they can answer these four questions, they understand search and seizure to a very high degree. Number one, they need to, you know, everybody needs to know who did the search or seizure, question number one. Because if it's not the police or the agent, it is not a Fourth Amendment issue, period. So teach students that private searches are not government searches and evidence can be used even if it would have violated the Fourth Amendment, right? It's just the way it is. The Fourth Amendment does not apply to people citizens and so if even if they if they did something that you could not do but you had nothing to do with that do with it then it's good to go so when does a private search become a government search number one did you participate did you order it did you encourage it if you did it's likely a government search in other words they are your government agent and so forth and number two are they acting on your behalf it's one thing to be like hey man would you Will you go into that house and, you know, or, or uh, let's say you go to a motel. Hey, manager, will you go into that motel room and see if there's any drugs in plain view? And they're like, I ain't going in there. I can't, I can't do that. Okay. And which is true, by the way, right? You can't make them your agent. And then for some reason, they go in there for another re They go in there for another reason, completely unrelated to what you were talking about. And they find drugs in plain view and they still call you. If those are your facts, that person was not an agent of the government. But if before she was like, yeah, sure, I'll go in there. She was an agent and it would be evidence suppressed. Here's an example, okay, out of New Jersey. It's a great example, though, uh, from Atlantic City. Casino uh, security personnel illegally searched a patron and found cocaine. What they were doing in this case is they were going to kick him out for trespassing. They have no reason to be in his backpack. Why are you in his backpack? There is no evidence of, of trespassing and so forth. So they actually trespassed on his the, the, the guy has a tort claim against the casino. They find the cocaine, they call the police, the department comes up, right? Um, so the, the, the guy, the, the, uh, the police come up, they see that they, they grab the cocaine and they charge him. We are good, right? We are good. Okay, and somebody asked me a very important question. Not only am I okay with it, I'm gonna give you the slides so that you can share the information. All I ask is, you know, try to help me spread these webinars around and, you know, get the word out. But I'm teaching you because I want you to adopt these as your own, essentially. And that's what training is, right? Okay. So I'll show you drugs. <laughs> hey, six feet apart, <laughs> six feet apart uh, fist bump. So here's another a, a case of uh, New Jersey. And this is actually the, the, the hotel that was in question. And the hotel manager found drugs in plain view, called the police. She says, I'll show you the drugs in the room. The cops fo just followed her. She opened the door. She opened the door. She walks in. The guy's gone, right? He's, it's still a rented room, but he's not there. 
the police, all they do is walk in and see drugs in plain view. We are not good, right? We're not good because the police participated in a search of a protected area. Michael, I'm just going to probably e email these to you guys. So I'll email them to you after class today. So, because normally I don't put these on the website. So I'll email them to you. So here is additional resources, right? The book talks about all of these issues. Okay, Franco, go for it. Let me get a drink of water while you, Frank, Franco, write your question. Okay, ah, now I can't drink my water now, right? You wrote very quickly. Okay, the cat is out of the bag. However, by the way, he's referring to another search that we talk about, but he, the cops have no right to go into the room. She has no quote, common authority over the room, right? She has no common authority. That's mastering consent searches. By the way, that's at 6 p.m. tonight. So at noon, hot pursuit and fresh pursuit. And at 6 p.m., we're doing mastering consent searches. She has no right to consent to the police. Now, the cat out of the bag. The problem with that is that in order to do a cat out of the bag search, the item has to be brought to the police, the backpack, and so forth. If the item is still in a secure or a, 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 an, an area where, the, where the, the, the defendant has an expectation of privacy, like a house, you can't go in there and grab it out. So, yes, absolutely. Matthew, absolutely. That's what they, and by the way, and by the way, Matthew, that's what they should have done. That's what they should have done. They should have gone and got a warrant with the, and right. Correct. Again, right. That's a great example. She has no right to be there, but did she violate the Fourth Amendment? Yes or no? Use it in a warrant. Use it in a warrant. The only, yeah, use it in a warrant. The only place that gets a little tricky is Texas, okay? And you don't need exigency. You don't need it. Right. Oh, right, right. There is no exigency. Thank you. There is no exigency. Right. So what if the ha uh, uh, housekeeping that went in there and discovered the drugs, doesn't housekeeping have a right to be there? If no, do not disturb. We have, that's not the problem. The problem is cops going into the room. If cops go into the room, you need exigency because cops have no right to go into that room and the housekeeping person cannot give them consent. The manager cannot give them consent. They don't have what's called common authority. I'll deal with that at 6 p.m. tonight. If you, if you want more, more info on that, burn the midnight oil. Correct. That's exactly right, Matthew. Yep. Well, Demetrius, it's better to say privacy in their stuff, but better it's privacy in the room. The room is still a legitimate expectation of privacy. Okay. So if housekeeping discovered, they would still have to bring the cops there. Once the cops cross the threshold, it's a problem without a warrant. Um, basically, yes, there might be. Okay. Question number two. Okay. So question number one is kind of easy. Was it, was it, so I'm getting a question that I probably should answer, but you know, if it's not a government agent or the police involved in the search, it's generally not an issue. Somebody's asked me about this problem in Texas. The problem in Texas, and it's, it's a little complicated, but let me just give you what the, in Texas, they have a rule of criminal procedure. It's like 38.42 or something like that, which says that if a citizen violates the law, then that cannot be used as evidence in trial. Now, can you still use it in warrants? The answer seems to be yes. I'm not, you know, we're not sure about that. But as long as the, 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 the hotel manager did not violate the law when they went into the hotel, to the room to inspect for a water leak, to see if there was trash prop, whatever, then we are good. But if they committed a burglary, then the evidence can't be used in a Texas court. There it is. So question number two is, was it a protected area, right? Was it a protected area? So teach students that the Fourth Amendment protects people, things, and places, right? The Fourth Amendment uh, protects people, things, and places. There's two big exceptions, and those are open fields and abandoned property, okay? So first, 
know that the Fourth Amendment protects everybody in the United States, this is gonna be kind of funny sounding, that has made it into the interior. <laughs> if, if, if somebody crossed the border and they got essentially past border patrol and now they're in the interior, <laughs> then they're given full Fourth Amendment protections. But if, they, if border patrol catch them, catches them before they make it in, then they don't have full Fourth Amendment protections. And you've seen the movie Sicario, remember when they're all in that waiting area to get back on the bus? They don't have Fourth Amendment, <laughs> full Fourth Amendment protections at that point. So you don't normally deal with these issues. The people you're dealing with are, right, abandoned property. So it's open fields and abandoned property. Second, you're welcome. The Fourth Amendment protects, it says houses, but the better way to teach this is structures and curtilage. The Fourth Amendment is just not descriptive enough. You know, it doesn't just protect houses. Burger King has protection. Okay, um, Burger King has protection. You can certainly go into Burger King, go into the lobby, look around, right? But if you charge past the registers and you go back into the manager's office and you start snooping around, then that's a Fourth Amendment violation. That's a Fourth Amendment vi issue. Now, whether it's a violation, we can talk about that in my advanced class. It gets a little tricky about standing and privacy rights and so forth. But that is not a house, but it is, it is protected under the Fourth Amendment. And curtilage. If you want to know about curtilage, A, take the class tomorrow. I go into deep discussion about curtilage. Or I talk about it briefly in my warrantless entries class uh, uh, webinar. Green, yellow, red. Now, I may be jinxing myself here, but I got to tell you something I forgot to tell you. Over the last few days, I've been, I'm, and I'm, you're going to be like, Anthony, you just jinxed yourself and watch, look, look what's going to happen. Over the last previous webinars, I've had some issues with, with Zoom, and I think I traced it down to um, my router needing to be hard reset. But the reason I bring it up, and I was going to talk to you about this morning, is if, my, if, the, if Zoom does crash, and I know you're thinking I'm jinxing myself, if it does crash, I will be back up in a few minutes. But so far, so good. But it has been doing it, and I'm just letting you know. All right. Finally, data. The Fourth Amendment says papers, okay? Right, persons, houses, papers, and effects. But don't teach it that way, right? Teach it as papers, but also data. Data, where, where do most people keep their private papers? On their phone, Google Drive, OneDrive, Dropbox. Those are fully protected by the Fourth Amendment. And finally, possessions. The Fourth Amendment says effects. I don't really like the word effects because we don't use that, you know, every day. If you bought a brand new Camaro and I come up to you, I'm like, man, that's a pretty badass effect you got there. No, it's a possession, right? It's a possession. So just that's what we, we're talking about, things which are connected to the person. However, do realize that, right, that it essentially protects everything except abandoned property in open fields abandoned property and open fields. If you want to know a lot more about abandoned property, again, join me tomorrow. I talk all about it. All right. So, and also take the, uh, the warrantless entry class for curlage, curlage. All right. For cell phones, if you see a message pop up with relevant information to what you are investigating, does that fall under plain view? Yes, absolutely. If you are lawfully holding the phone, plain view. Another thing is, uh, let me give you another one, okay? When you take a phone for, for an, as an arrest and you are doing, um, basically you're going to inventory the person's property, right? And you hit the power button to make sure that the phone is, is operating because that may be something that you do as a practice to make sure that they're not going to say that you broke their phone. Well, the phone never worked in the beginning, you know. Then if you see a picture on there of the guy holding a gun, um, that is also plain view. If you can articulate that you hit the power button to test that it was functional. Um, don't have a lot of cases on it, but I do see cops doing it and I think it's lawful. Yes, uh, plain view is nothing more than right to be, right to see. Okay. Okay, hold on. So somebody wants a follow-up question and it's, it's so hold on. So, um, 
Okay, so back to the maid showing the Leo the, the, the suspected drugs. Who is going to sign a warrant based off of what a maid said she saw, right? If the officers entered the room with her for welfare check on unknown substance, once Leo suspects it's drugs, then back off and get a warrant. No, first of all, um, the, 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 the housekeeping person is a presumptive, no, if, if she tells you, if she's giving you information that, a, that is probable cause, um, why do you think it's drugs? Well, officer, it's on a mirror and it's a razor blade next to it. It's white. Um, it looks like marijuana. I, you know, I know what marijuana looks like, Your Honor. I've been around it, you know, and so forth. Then she's presumptively reliable. So that I talk about those issues in my day three class, which is advanced criminal investigations. So that that's an easy one, personally. I mean, I she, if she saw contraband, most likely she can describe it to a to a point where you also believe it's contraband, and you can put her into a warrant. Does putting a phone on airplane mode to prevent wiping constitute a search? Um, here's the deal, okay? Is <laughs> it, it probably not, okay? Probably not. Because you're not searching for anything, you're just turning it off. However, I recommend that you do not art, you know, articulate it, right? I, look, my, first of all, what I teach what I ideally like is for cops to have the Faraday bags with them. You know what the Faraday bags are, right? The bags that are like gray with the lines in it. Go get Faraday bags off of eBay and, and buy them with your own money if you have to. You know why? Because then we just skip the whole thing or aluminum foil and so forth. Just skip the whole thing. Skip the whole going to the phone. But here's the other deal, okay? If you turn the phone onto airplane mode and you also see evidence in plain view, you have no constitutional requirement to use that plain view evidence in your warrant. I'm just telling you, um, you may wanna leave it out. Bag it. Bag it is my preferred method, bag it. Just stay out of the whole airplane mode business. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Currently, we've been told that Faraday bags are so cheap that they are considered considering a search because it could ca cause have been, I'm not sure what that, I may be missing something, but that's not a search. It's not a, that's not a search. I, I don't agree with that. I, I'm not sure what the logic there is. Okay, question number three. Question, and maybe I'm missing something, Daniel, but I'm just not seeing it as a search. There's no, I, we're gonna define what a search is right now, actually. So. Question number one that you, that you address with your students. Hey, is this even a search? I'm sorry, is this even a, a, a Fourth Amendment issue? Did a police officer or their agent do it? No, use it is, it, is, the, is the basic rule. Next thing is, thank you, I appreciate that. Next thing is, are we even involved in a protected area? Again, the key, the answer is generally yes, but let's look for the exceptions, which is open fields and abandoned property, check. Now the next one is, did a search or seizure even occur, right? Did a search or seizure even occur? So there are two types of searches under the Fourth Amendment. This is why, you know, this is why I'm kind of like pushing back. Like, I don't know what, what the search is under that Faraday bag situation because here is the definition of a search. The term search is said to imply some exploratory investigation. It's an invasion. It's a quest, it's looking for or seeking out. A search implies some sort of force. Dropping a phone in a bag is not a quest for any information. It's just preventing it from being wiped. It implies a prying, prying into hidden places for that which is concealed or hidden. There is nothing being revealed. Though searching relies mostly on sight, the mere looking at that which is open to view is not a Fourth Amendment search. So I think it was Amanda that talked about Boop, the, the text message, plain view, plain view. You have a right to be, right to see. A Fourth Amendment search involves a protected area. If not, it's not a search, right? It's not a search. So there's two types of searches, reasonable expectation of privacy and a trespass in a protected area. Now, I'm gonna go over these very briefly, very briefly. 
but I do want you to know about the CATS case. CATS is the, is the case that established a reasonable expectation of privacy. What happened here is a guy named Charles Katz was a bookie in 1960s. He lives in LA. He calls his counterparts in Miami and Boston every day from a phone booth. Why doesn't he use his own home phone? Because he's worried that it's tapped. He goes into the phone booth and we have a lot of young people on this webinar. I cannot see you and I cannot hear you, but I know that you, there are a lot of young people here and this is a phone booth. This is a first generation iPhone. If I do not tell you that, you will have no idea what I'm talking about. So he goes in there, he makes his phone calls, he covers his mouth, <laughs> he covers his mouth, he's, he's worried about lip readers, he talks softly, he shuts the door, the feds can't get him, right? <laughs> so what they do, <laughs> Chia, I assure you, you are not that old. I used to, you read that in a history book. You never knew it cost five cents. <laughs> Gee, it works me, by the way. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. So, so, so what happens is the FBI puts a, <laughs> puts a phone booth, a, a, a recording, a microphone. I'm all lost. <laughs> you guys are throwing me off track. Puts a microphone on top of the phone booth to listen to Charles's phone calls. Based off of those, those recordings, they indict him for racketeering and so forth. And now he's, he goes to the Fourth Amendment, uh, to, the, to the Supreme Court and says, that was a Fourth Amendment search. Was that a Fourth Amendment search, yes or no? I need some water while I do that. Okay, <laughs> that is a search under the Fourth Amendment. So here's why. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, hell. hey, this is why you come to the classes, right? It was outside. It was outside of the phone booth. It was on top of it, but outside. Here's what's going on here, okay? So first of all, this is what the court came up with. A, this is a reasonable expectation of privacy, right? Did Charles, did he subjectively expect that he would have privacy in that phone booth? Did he, did he think that, the, that, that people could hear him? Yes or no, right. And do you think society would, would expect us to be reasonable? <laughs> right? So, one of the reasons I love these webinars too, by the way, is all this. Oh, snap, Franco beat me to the punch. Okay, so both are required, okay? But here's what I would like you to teach your fellow people, right, your officers. The 100 person test, which is Franco is discussing right there. This is the 100 person test, okay? Don't just get rid of that, that two part test. That's for lawyers. Okay. That's for lawyers. And we have them on this, this webinar, but for my cops do this test. It's easier. Ask yourself, okay, if you had a hundred people in a room, okay, this is pre Corona picture. And this is like, this is going to be historic one day because we'll never be allowed to be, to sit next to people anymore. Right? So you ask these hundred people, now these hundred people are not cops and they're not all criminals. Because if you ask a room full of cops, can we do it? They say, hell yeah. You ask a room full of criminals, can we do it? They say, hell no. Instead, these are a hundred people from your community. Hey, hundred people, can I put a, a, a microphone on the outside of a phone booth and it's gonna be so, it's gonna be sensitive enough to hear your phone call inside the phone booth. Can I do that? Yes or no? What's the, what's the 100 people gonna say, the majority? Hell no. Therefore, it's a search. If you believe that they would say no, then, and if you're right, again, you could be wrong, but if you are right, that is a search under the Fourth Amendment. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's funny. Okay, let's apply this to drones. Now, guys, while we do this exercise, okay, get rid of your preconceived, get rid of your knowledge about state law, okay? Just so, you, just so we can get this out of the way. When we talk about constitutional law, you know, your state laws are not really the, the determining factor. They can come into play as a factor of reasonableness of what you should do. But just, I don't want people saying, well, Anthony, I can't deploy a drone unless it's an emergency and so forth. Let's just talk about the Fourth Amendment real quick. Okay, hey, 100 people, okay? Hey, 100 people. I want to deploy a drone over a public park about 100 feet in the air, and I just want to look around. I don't want to use magnification. I don't want to use thermal imaging. I just want to look and, and look around. And hey, what if I happen to see in somebody's backyard and I see a car that we know is stolen? 100 people, right? Majority wins. You don't have, you don't have all 100 people. 100 people, is that... Is that, can I do that? Does that invade your privacy? Yes or no? Wow. Guys, can't, the, the, Rodney King said one time, can we just all get along? Why, why are we having these fights? Why can't we get along, guys? Why are there so many yeses and nos? The answer is, Michael asked a good question. Are they lawfully there? They are complying with, what, 107? And let's also say they're complying with state law, okay? And let's also, just to throw it out here, just even other people fly their drones in the park. Are we good, yes or no? Intent is not going to be too much... Intent probably shouldn't matter too much here. It's objective reasonableness. So here is the legal, here's the answer. I guess I've messed you guys all up because we can't get on the same page. That is not a search under the Fourth Amendment. It's Anthony's, well, Anthony didn't send that to everybody, but that's not a search under the Fourth Amendment. These, when you go to the park, Okay, if you, live, if you live next to a park and people fly their drones around there and they're not violating any law, okay? I'm not saying any law, FFA regulations are complied with. There's no law violation. And you're living in this house. Is it reasonable that if you have a, a, a stolen car in the backyard and you know that these drones are flying around that you, you have to tell, if, if one of them is a cop, you have to say, nope, you can't look, you can't look around like everybody else can. Is that reasonable? The answer is no. That's not reasonable. If you live near a park and you know drones can be flown over there legally, guess what you have taken the risk by putting a stolen car in your backyard? You've taken the risk that it will be seen in public view. Correct, that's right. Yep, it's same as flying a kite, an airplane. Some parks have cameras. It's what is reasonable. Now look, right? Okay, let's do something else. If you're sunbathing in your backyard, and Lloyd, first of all, I know you, and you should not be doing that, okay? I mean, you got a hell of a face, but your body needs work, okay? So, <laughs> it's good to see. You. What? No, ouch. It's my friend. I can make jokes if it's my friend, right? So, <laughs> look, you guys want to see me sunbathing either. I can assure you, we're Lloyd and I are in the same boat. So, now let's change the facts, okay? He's not wrong. Let's change the facts. The, the cops deployed the drone, okay? Over the public park, no law violation. They believe that there is a meth lab inside the house. So they're looking around, but they can't see in the windows because it's kind of dark in the house. They then use a telescoping lens to zoom into, see inside the window. Bam! They see a meth lab. Are we good? Yes or no? Correct. 
Correct. Fourth Amendment search. Now, when you ask 100 people, can I do that? They're going to say, no, that's intrusive. They're going to say, look, I mean, flying a drone in a public place, I have, you know, if a helicopter flies in my backyard, but that's, that goes beyond. Exactly right. That would be a search under the Fourth Amendment. You would need some form of exigency. Now, the other one, the other search here is the Jones search, okay? Jones is not about privacy. It's about trespass. What happened here is the right, is that uh, police officers put a GPS tracking device on Anton Jones's car, tracked it for 28 days and so forth, and used that information in a warrant. The court said that this is a search under the Fourth Amendment. Why? Because they touched the vehicle with the intent to gather information. It's not just the privacy expectation. That's, that was also an issue in the case, but it's just the touching of the car. And that's on Anton Jones. And they found 91 kilos of cocaine in a warehouse, $800,000 in cash. He was a, a very big player. So, um, so that's the Jones search, right? It has two requirements. So police touch or enter a protected area, something that's protected with the intent to gather information. So to just use a lens from a public place, look, as long as you're not violating the law and you're not being overly intrusive, right? Hovering over somebody's backyard, um, watching the backyard for you know, an hour straight, just be cool about it. Just do what the public could do and you're, you're likely to search under the Fourth Amendment. Do we have a lot of cases on it? No, because the drone cases have to, but that's making good law. Just do what the public can do and you should be okay. You should be okay. So here is my, my, my case that brings home this point about this is a search and, you, and a, a lot of academies are not teaching this. A lot of academies are just focusing on that privacy stuff. But don't forget this one because this one can get cops in trouble too. You can look at a vehicle with thermal. You can't look at a house, but you can look at a vehicle. And if a canine, if a canine's nose touches the exterior of a vehicle during a free air sniff, is that a touch? No, that's not a that's not a search. Take my traffic stops and canines, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you more. There is an issue there, but under those facts, it's not a search. It's instinctual. Okay, let's talk about the wobbling tire case. So a Texas trooper was behind Jennifer Lynn Richmond driving a 2004 Dodge Ram pickup truck. He suspects that she's involved in something, so he does a pretext stop. The pretext, the, the, um, the reason for the stop is a wobbling right rear tire, right? They're at safety. We get her pulled over. While we're talking to her, she's suspicious as all hell. Her travel, her travel plans don't make sense. She's saying that she's gonna visit a friend in like Dallas. Well, where's your friend live? I'm going to Google it when I get there. Get the hell out of the car. We're going to talk, right? Get the hell out. So he then goes back to that tire that was shaking, and he suspects that something is in there, but he does not have probable cause for any drug violation, just reasonable suspicion. He pokes on the tire. Something drops. He takes the car back to a dealership. He searches it. What does he find in the tires? 61 pounds of meth. I'm sorry, heroin, and like 16 or something pounds of, of meth. So... She goes to court. She says, when the trooper poked on my tire, that was a search under the Fourth Amendment. Is it a search, yes or no? Okay. <laughs> so, it is a search, okay? It goes to the Fifth Circuit. They, they, you know, she appeals it because the, the lower court actually said it wasn't a search. She appeals it to the Fifth Circuit. It was a search, but um, you got to tell me what that. What are you doing with with the with the burping technique? How are you getting how are you getting the air out of the uh, of the car? So just tell me. That's that's what I'm assuming. You're somehow getting the air out of the car. How how are you doing that? All right, so this is a search under the Fourth Amendment. We'll continue while you, while you ask that question. But if it's parked, I 
Oh, by the way, by the way, by the way, I, I want to make sure one thing clear. For you guys that don't know, this is a case I use in my all-day class, but it was upheld for, for vehicle safety. It was upheld for vehicle safety. So, no, we're actually good. But my, the, the point is, is that do you think the, um, the cop thought at all that he was searching the car when he poked on the tire? He's been poking tires in Texas for years. And nobody's ever gave him any kind of BS except, right, Jennifer Lynn Richmond. And he still won because it was authorized under the automobile. It was under, for, uh, for safety of the car because that tire was. But if he would have poked a different tire that was not wobbling, evidence suppressed. Unless you had probable cause first or consent. Now, physical seizure occurs when you prevent somebody's movement. Your intentions do not matter. And accidental seizures may result in civil liability. So my point here is, actually, do I have a video on this? Yeah. Uh, once, let me show this video real quick. So Jeffrey Johnson is right by the planters. He pulls out a gun because the cops are chasing because he just killed somebody. And the cops shoot him. So we're kind of running out of time a little bit. So I just kind of want to push through this a little bit. So hold on. No, that was her physical seizure. Hold on. Your intentions do matter, right? If it's a physical, if it's a physical seizure, your intentions do matter. If it's an accidental se physical seizure, your intentions don't matter. We are talk you're talking about the show of authority, right? If it's a show of authority, then I don't talk about it here, right? Exactly. So, no problem. I, I'm glad you brought that up, but I didn't I didn't talk about show of authority here just because we don't have time. So here's what happened: Jeffrey Johnson killed a coworker. The police are tracking him down and trying to corral him. They're trying to get more backup. He pulls out the gun. He pulls the trigger. It goes click, not bang. They end up shooting him. Plus, they shot nine people in the background. Nine people, nine innocent people. Were those nine innocent people seized under the Fourth Amendment, yes or no? No. Correct, Leo. No, no seizure. Now, are they going to pay big? Are they going to get cut checks from the New York, you know, right? Yes. In fact, if I was there, if I saw the police shooting all these, these guns, I would jump into the line of fire so I can get paid. But I could not sue them for a Fourth Amendment violation. I would have to sue them under a tort claim. Either way, I'll get some money, but I'm just letting you know that that is not a Fourth Amendment seizure. So if you want more on these issues, <laughs> beer, it's gonna be more than beer money, I'm definitely buying with my, with my, with my, my, my wing, you know what I mean? I got wings, I got wings. Um, so the full day classes is where we get deep into these issues, <laughs> not legal advice. <laughs> All right, finally, the final question is, do you have crew, okay? I'm going to tell you what crew is in a second, but here is my thing, okay? If you, these four questions matter. In fact, if you go onto the website, I have a little card that has Miranda on one side, and on the other side is these four questions to remind you what we talked about today. I think it's important. This is how you solve a, a lot of Fourth Amendment issues. But if you say yes to question number one, yes to two, yes to three, and you get to number four, you need articulation. You cannot just say, right? I always do business that way. You need a, a reason because what you've done implicates the fourth amendment. That's the way I was trained. I've always done it that way. It, I did it as a best practice and I did it for officer safety are not fourth amendment exceptions. You will never, ever, ever see a, a case that says the officer was good with his search or seizure 
because he's done it that way for 20 years and we've never had a problem with it. That's not going to be the exception. It's going to be just, it's going to be articulation. Correct. And, and even now Hickson, right? We work together. He, he has more years on than I do. But I, I bet you when I went to the Academy in 2005 and when he went to the Academy, I bet you they, they talked about this. Um, just articulate officer safety and call it a day. Bullshit. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. So you need, right, it's true. You need articulation. You need articulation. So here it is, okay? If you are in question number four, you have to have crew. This is one of the big takeaways here, guys. You have to be teaching this, I believe. This is the best way to teach it. Do you have consent? Do you have somebody's consent from somebody who can give it? Master and consent search is at 6 p.m. tonight. I'll talk all about consent. Do you have a recognized exception? That's a phrase, recognized exception. That means, do you have a case that tells you that you can do what you just did? Now, sometimes you are on the fringe and you're making new case law like our drones, okay? Our drone cases are making new case law and so forth. But the point is, is do you have some cases that you can point to to say, yeah, I think I'm good here? And finally, do you have a warrant? You need one or more, sometimes you have two. You have a recognized exception like hot pursuit um, or, or PC is a good, sometimes you have probable cause to search your car, but you still ask for consent and they give it to you. So you have both reasons. You don't need both, but you have both. So I would, if you wanna know, now the recognized exceptions are all my three days of training, my three days of training but if you want to know about consent, join me today at six. So here are some examples of some recognized exceptions, right? Community caretaking, border searches. Man, they, they, they freaking own you at the border. Hey, um, you're, going to, you're going to Mexico? Okay, you know, we're gonna take off your gas tank and just look around. Can you do that? Oh yeah, we can do it. Um, there was a case from the border where they, they, they had reasonable suspicion that this lady was a balloon smuggler, right? Balloons. They kept her incommunicado for two days with no access to the outside world and only just water and, and maybe some food until she pooped out 81 balloons. She sued. She says, that is completely violating my Fourth Amendment rights. And she was, you know, and the, 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 the court said, we don't have a problem with it. If you go to the border, <laughs> You're taking a risk. Um, highly regulated business, right? Gun dealers and junkyards, fishing. If I have wildlife officers on here, which I usually do, hunting and fishing is a highly regulated activity. That's why they get the demand to see your catch without a warrant, without reasonable suspicion, to make sure you're not violating poaching laws. DUI checkpoints, VIN inspections, and so forth. Cars. Right? What are some recognized exceptions for cars? Inventories, the car's abandoned, community caretaking, again, border searches, VIN inspections, and so forth. Now, here is a just a, a quick reminder is that a lot of you are gonna teach or, you know, and when I say teach, I'm also talking about my FTOs out there. You know, I, I hope that my FTOs are on here too. And you're teaching case law and so forth, but we talked about where to get information from. I, I think it's great to, you know, let's get all the information that we can. I, I, I'm, I'm subscribed to every legal update out there. But here is my, my point. Legal updates in and of itself are kind of limited in value. What I like better is I like instructors teaching the concepts of what do we do with that, with that doctrine, right, of that concept. Because if I tell you a case that upheld hot pursuit because, um, you know, the person was, you know, convicted of a, the person was suspected of a, uh, an armed robbery and the police are chasing him into his house. And, and that's what I teach you. You're going to leave there and be like, okay, if I have, if I'm chasing an armed robber, I can chase him to his house. But let's teach what the concept is. It's not just all about an armed robbery. It's about a serious case, usually. Not just that, or you know, an arrestable offense. Teach the, the 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 doctrines, 
not just the, the, the actual update. Because then you can use that information for more than what that court held in that particular case. Okay, it's been an hour and a half. That is quick and dirty, teaching search and seizure. You're welcome, James. Always good to have you here. Yep, we're definitely gonna have a, we, we are definitely, James, we're definitely gonna have a, a party at your place in CDA. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this, this webinar. If you want some follow-up questions, I, maybe I missed a question or two. Will you guys join me? Rick, put the, um, put the, uh, the link again for the afternoon. Again, we, 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 unfortunately, people were not, were a little confused on our, because we put the money in there. Thanks, man. Appreciate it, Franco. So, and I will get you the slides. I will email you, I will email you the slides. Um, Almond, email me your, here, actually, email, if you don't, if I don't have your email, then email me and I will respond. Okay, Rick, you want to throw it in there real quick? Anthony at Blue to Gold. You're, thank you, Richard. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Guys, spread the word. We had a lot of people today. Keep it going. Guys, keep it going. If you want me to keep this up, all I ask, all I ask is spread the word so that people know what I'm doing out here and I can teach them too. Demetrius, I'm going to email them to you, okay? I'm going to email them to you. Yep. Thank you, Demony. You're welcome. I'm glad you guys liked this. I wasn't sure. I was like, man, you know, this is, there's not a lot of videos in this, but I, I hope you guys, I packed them. Yeah, and man, I can't wait to get back to Pennsylvania. I can't be, wait to get back to PA. Thank you, Jessica. Oh, hey, Jessica, I'm going to be in at Las Vegas Metro in October doing all three days. So hopefully you can get into that class. Yeah, Lloyd, dude, I'm so glad you were here, man. And also, again, I'll be back. I will, I will be uh, down in, um, in, uh, in Metro again in October. So try to get into that class, brother. A, a lot of catching up to do. Uh, we, we, we have been to Richmond. We have to come back to Richmond. Yep, we got to do another class. I think we were there earlier this year, I thought. But, yeah. Pre, oh yeah, we're there pre-Rona. <laughs> pre-Rona. You know what? Give me the case. I would love to. I would love to. And and by the way, Josh, their approach is unworkable. It's absolutely unworkable. So just for the for the people who are still on, just interested a little bit, Oregon, their latest case about vehicle stops that you cannot ask any unrelated questions during a traffic stop, period. Even if it doesn't extend the traffic stop, even if it's done by presumably a backup officer, it's off limits and it's incredibly restrictive and it's unworkable. It's absolutely unworkable. Josh, my argument is if you go up there and say, hey, oh, you having a good day, sir? Well, I'm having a great day because I just had, uh, I took an, uh, a hit of meth just now. I mean, now what? Is that gonna be suppressed too because you asked something that's unrelated? It's crazy. You're welcome. All right, guys. I'll see you. <laughs> Wait a minute. Ho, ho, ho. Whoa, whoa. Can you guys not see me? No, Franco. No, you, dude. No, you, I think, ah, oh, that's a problem with, with Richard being a panelist. Are you seeing Richard Lewis on your, uh, are you seeing Richard Lewis on your, on your panel? I, I think that's what it is. You, you're seeing another panelist, which is Richard. And that's probably the issue. Okay. Hey, Franco, well, I don't know, man. I'm, I, I, I'm, I dressed up in everything. I dressed up and everything. I put, I got a suit on with uh, PJs, like I have been for the last uh, 45 days. I'm like, oh, Chia, you're making me blush. <laughs> yeah, 
Yep. No, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm coming correct. I'm 50% suit, 50% PJs. All right. Hey, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it, brother. Spread the word, man. You're welcome. All right, guys, I'll see you at noon. I'm going to go uh, talk to the fam, see if they're still here.